Mr. Poskett's Nightcaps Chapter 7 William Henry and the Dairymaid The trouble at Five Oaks Farm really began when Matthew Dennison built and started a model dairy and found it necessary to engage the services of a qualified dairymaid. A good many people in the neighbourhood wondered what possessed Matthew to embark on such an enterprise and said so. Matthew cared nothing for comment. He had in his pocket, he said, as he was very fond of saying, something that made him independent of whatever anybody might think or say. It was his whim to build the model dairy, just as it is the whim of some men to grow roses or to breed prize sheep at great cost, and he built it. It was all very spick and span when it was finished, and the countryside admired its many beauties and modern appliances without understanding much about them. And then came the question of finding a thoroughly expert dairymaid. Somebody, probably the vicar, advised Matthew to advertise in one of the farming papers, and he and his wife and their only son, William Henry, accordingly spent an entire evening in drafting a suitable announcement of their wishes, which they forwarded next day to several journals of a likely nature. During the next fortnight, answers began to come in, and the family sat in the committee every evening after high tea, considering them gravely. It was not until somewhere about 50 or 60 of these applications had been received, however, that one of a really promising nature turned up. This was from one Rosina Durant, who wrote from somewhere in Dorsetshire. She described herself as being 25 years of age, thoroughly qualified to take entire charge of a model dairy, and anxious to have some experience in the north of England. She gave particulars of her past experience, set forth particulars of the terms she expected, and enclosed a splendid testimonial from her present employer, who turned out to be a well-known countess. Matthew rubbed his hands. Now this is the very young woman we want, he said. I've always said from the very beginning that I'd have naught but what was first class. I shall send this here young person my references, agree to her terms, and tell her to start out as soon as she can. I'm afraid she's rather expensive, love, murmured Mrs. Dennison. I'm not to a few pounds one way or another, answered Matthew. I'm one of them that believe in doing a thing right when you do do it. Last two years with a countess, what? What would suit a countess will suit me. William Henry, you can get out the writing desk and we'll draw up a letter to this young woman at once. William Henry, who had little or no interest in the model dairy, and regarded it as more and no less than a harmless fad of his father's, complied with his request and spent half an hour in writing an elegant epistle after the fashion of those which he had been taught to compose at the boarding school where he had received his education. After that, he gave no more thought to the dairymaid, being much more concerned in managing the farm and in an occasional day's hunting and shooting than in matters outside his sphere. But about a week later, his father opened a letter at the breakfast table and uttered a gratified exclamation. Now, the young woman's coming today, he announced. She'll be at Mile Tree Station at precisely 4.30. Of course, somebody'll have to drive over and meet her. And that somebody can't be me, because I've a meeting at the Guardians at Combra at that very hour. William Henry, you must drive the dog cart over. William Henry was not too pleased with the idea, for he had meant to go fishing. But he remembered that he could go fishing every afternoon if it pleased him, and he acquiesced. I've been wondering, Matthew, said Mrs. Dennison, who was perusing the letter through her spectacles, I've been wondering where to put this young person. You can see from her writing that she's of a better sort. There's no common person as writers and expresses themselves in that style. I'm sure she'll not want to have her meals with the men and the girls in the kitchen. And of course we can't bring her among ourselves, as it were. Matthew scratched his head. Ding my buttons, he said. I never thought of that there. Of course she'll be what they call a sort of upper servant, such as the quality have. Aye, for sure. Well, let's see now. I'll tell you what to do, missus. Let her have the little parlour. We scarce ever use it, for her own sitting room, and she can eat there. That's the sensiblest arrangement that I can think on. Then we shall all preserve our various ranks. What do ye say, William Henry? William Henry said he was agreeable to anything, and proceeded to make his usual hearty breakfast. He thought no more of his afternoon expedition until the time for setting out came, and then he had the brown mare hastened to a smart dog cart, and set off along the roads for Maltry, five miles away. It was a pleasant afternoon in early April, and the land had the springtide's new warmth on it, and William Henry thought how happy he would have been with his fishing rod. Maltry is a junction where several lines converge, and when the train from the south came in, several passengers alighted from it to change to other routes. Amongst this crowd, William Henry could not detect anything that looked like the new dairymaid, 
He scrutinised everybody as he sat on a seat opposite the train and summed them up. There was a clergyman and his wife. There was a sailor. There were three or four commercial travellers. There were some nondescripts. Then his attention became riveted on a handsome young lady who left a carriage with an armful of books and papers and hurried off to the luggage van. She was so handsome, so well-dressed, and had such a good figure that William Henry's eyes followed her with admiration. Then he remembered what he had come there for and looked again for the dairymaid, but he saw nothing that suggested her. The people drifted away, the platform cleared, and presently nobody but the handsome young lady and William Henry remained. She stood by a trunk looking expectantly about her, he rose, intending to go. A porter appeared. She spoke to him. The porter turned to William Henry. "'Here's a lady inquiring for you, sir,' he said. The lady came forward with a smile and held out her hand. "'Are you Mr Dennison?' she said. "'I am Miss Durant.' William Henry's first instinct was to open his mouth cavernously, his second to remove his hat. "'How do you do?' he said falteringly. Uh, "'I was looking about for you.' "'But of course you wouldn't know me,' she said. "'I was looking for you.' "'I've got a dog cat outside,' said William Henry. "'Here, Jenkinson, bring this lady's things to my trap.' "'He escorted Mr Rant, who had already sized him up as a simple-natured "'but very good-looking young man, to the dog cart, "'saw her luggage safely stowed away at the back, "'helped her in, tucked her up in a thick rug, "'got in himself and drove away. "'I'm quite looking forward to seeing your dairy, Mr Dennison,' said Miss Durant. It must be quite a model from your description. William Henry turned and stared at her. She was a very handsome young woman, he decided. A brunette, with rich colouring, dark eyes, a ripe mouth, and a flashing smile. And her voice was as pleasing as her face. Lord bless you, he said. It isn't my dairy. I know nothing about dairying. It's father's. Miss Durant laughed merrily. Oh, I see, she said. You are Mr Dennison's son. What shall I call you, then? "'My name is William Henry Dennison,' he replied. "'And what do you do, Mr William?' she asked. "'Look after the farm,' replied William Henry. "'Father doesn't do much that way now. He's sort of retired. "'Do you know anything about farming?' "'I love anything about a farm,' she answered. "'Do you care for pigs?' he asked eagerly. "'I've been going in a lot for pig breeding this last year or two, "'and I've got some of the finest pigs in England. "'I got a first prize at the Smithfield show last year. "'I'll show it you when we get home.' There's some interest now in breeding prize pigs. With such pleasant conversation, they whiled their time away until they came in sight of Five Oaks Farm, on beholding which Miss Durant was immediately lost in admiration, saying that it was the finest old house she had ever seen, and that it would be a delight to live in it. Some of it's over 500 years old, said William Henry, and our family built it. We don't rent our land, you know. It's our own. 600 acres there are, and uncommon good land too. With that, he handed over Miss Durant to his mother, who was obviously as surprised at her appearance as he had been, and then drove around to the stables, still wondering how a lady came to be a dairymaid. "'And I'm sure I don't know, Matthew,' said Mrs. Dennison to her husband that night in the privacy of their own chamber. "'I really don't know how Miss Durant ought to be treated. "'You can see for yourself what her manners are, quite the lady. "'Of course we all know nowadays that shop girls and such like "'give themselves the airs of duchesses and ape their manners, "'but Miss Durant's the real thing, or I'm no judge.' Very like her people's come down in the world, and she has to earn her own living. Poor thing. Well, never you mind, Jane Ann, said Matthew. Lady or no lady, she's my dairy maid, and all that I ask of her is that she does her work to my satisfaction. If she's a lady, you'll see that she'll always bear in mind that her present position is that of a dairy maid, and she'll behave according. We'll see what the morrow brings forth. What the morrow brought forth was the spectacle of the dairy maid. Julie attired in professional garments of spotless hue, busily engaged in the performance of her duties. Matthew spent all morning with her in the dairy, and came in to dinner beaming with satisfaction. "'She's a regular clinker, is that lass?' he exclaimed to his wife and son. "'I've found a perfect treasure!' The perfect treasure settled down into her new life with remarkable readiness. She accepted the arrangements which Mrs Dennison had made without demur. Mrs. Dennison, with a woman's keen observation, noticed that she was never idle. She was in and about the dairy all day long. At night she worked or read in her own room. She had brought a quantity of books with her, magazines and newspapers were constantly arriving for her. As the days went on, Mrs. Dennison decided that Mr. Durant's people had most certainly come down in the world, 
and that she had had to go out into it to earn her own living. Just look at how well she's dressed when she goes to church on a Sunday, she said to Matthew. None of you gaudy flaunting dressings up, but all of the best and quietest, just like the squire's lady. Hey dear, there's nobody knows what that poor young woman mayn't have known. Very likely they kept their horses and carriages in better days. Doesn't seem to be very much cast down, said Matthew. The lass is light-hearted enough, but ye women always are fanciful. While Mrs. Dennison indulged herself in speculations as to what the dairymaid had been, in the course of which she formed various theories, inclining most to one that her father had been a member of Parliament who had lost all his money on the stock exchange, and while Matthew contented himself by regarding Miss Durant solely in a professional capacity, William Henry was journeying along quite another path. He was, in fact, falling head over heels in love. He received a first impression when he saw Miss Durant at Maltry Station, he received a second, a much stronger one, next morning when he saw her in the spotless linen of the professional dairymaid. He began haunting the dairy until the fact was noticed by his mother. "'Why, I thought you cared not about dairying, William Henry,' she said, one day at dinner. "'I'm sure you never went near it when your father was laying it out.' "'What's the use of seeing anything till it's finished and in full working order?' said William Henry. "'Now that it's in go, one might as well learn all about it.' "'Well, you couldn't have a better instructress,' said Matthew." She can show you something you never saw before, can Mr. Durant. Mr. Durant was certainly showing William Henry Dennison something he had never seen before. He had always been apathetic towards young women, and it was with the greatest difficulty that he could be got to attend tea parties or dances or social gatherings, at all of which he invariably behaved like a bear who has got into a cage full of animals whom it does not like and cannot exterminate. But it became plain that he was beginning to cultivate the society of Mr. Durant. He haunted the dairy of an afternoon, when Matthew invariably went to sleep. He made excuses to bring Miss Durant into the family circle of an evening. He waylaid her on her daily constitutional, and at last one Sunday he deliberately asked her to walk to church with him at a neighbouring village. And at this, his mother's eyes were opened. Matthew, she said, when Henry William and Miss Durant had departed. That boy's smitten with Miss Durant. He's making up to her. Matthew, who was disposed to a peaceful nap, snorted incredulity. "'Ye women take such fancies into your heads,' he said. "'I've seen no. "'You men are so blind,' retorted Mrs. Dennison. "'He's always going into the dairy. "'He's been walks with her. "'He's always getting me to ask her in here to play the piano.' "'And uncommon well she plays it too,' grunted Matthew. "'And now he's taken her off to church,' concluded Mrs. Dennison. "'He's smitten, Matthew. He's smitten.' Matthew stirred uneasily in his chair. "'Well, well, my lass,' he said. "'Ye know what young folks are. "'They like each other's company. "'What do you think I sought your company for? "'Not to sit and stare at you as if you were a strange image, I know.' "'Well, it all went on and ended in the proper way,' said his wife sharply. "'But how do you know where this'll end?' "'I didn't know that all had begun,' said Matthew. "'Mrs. Dennison, who was reading what she called a Sunday book,' took off her spectacles and closed the book with a snap. Matthew, she said. You know that it's always been a settled thing, since they were children, that William Henry should marry his cousin Polly, your only brother John's one child, so that the property of the two families should be united when the time comes for us old ones to go. And it's got to be carried out as that arrangement, Matthew, and we can't let no dairymaids, ladies as come down or not, interfere with it. Matthew, who was half asleep, bethought himself vaguely of something that had been said long ago, when Polly was born, or at her christening. When the right time came, she and William Henry, then six years old, were to wed. John, Matthew's younger brother, had gone in for trade, and was now a very well-to-do merchant in Clothford, of which city he had been mayor. Matthew woke up a little, made a rapid calculation, and realised that Polly must now be nineteen years of age. "'Aye, aye, my lass,' he said. "'But you've got to remember,' Whatever fathers and mothers say, children don't always agree to. William Henry and Polly mightn't hit it off. Polly'll be a fine young lady now, what with all them French governesses and boarding schools in London and Paris and such like. Ah, William Henry, said Mrs. Dennison, with heat and emphasis, is good enough for any young woman of his own class. And a man who's owned six hundred acres of land is as good as any Clothford worsted merchant, even if he has been mayor. And now you listen to me, Matthew Dennison. I had a letter yesterday from Mrs. John, saying that she believed it would do Polly good to go into the country, as she'd been looking a bit Pollyish since she came back from Paris, and asking if we could do with her for a few weeks. 
So tomorrow morning, I shall go over to Clothford and bring her back with me. I've already written to say I should. We haven't seen her for five years. She was a pretty girl then, and must be a beauty by now, and we'll hope that her and William Henry will come together. And if you take my advice, Matthew, you'll get rid of the dairymaid. Matthew slowly rose from his chair. Then I'm danged if I do out of the sort, he said. You can fetch Polly and welcome, missus, and naught will please me better than if her and William Henry does hit it off, though I don't approve of the marriage of cousins as a rule. But I'm not going to get rid of my dairymaid, for no Polly's, nor yet to William Henry's, nor for naught so there. Then Mrs. Dennison put on her spectacles again and reopened her Sunday book, and Mr. Dennison mixed himself a drink at the sideboard and lighted a cigar and for a long time no sound was heard but the purring of the cat on the hearth and the ticking of the grandfather clock in the corner. Miss Mary Dennison duly arrived the next evening under convoy of her aunt and received a cordial and boisterous welcome at the hands and lips of her uncle and cousin. She was an extremely pretty and vivacious girl of nineteen, golden-haired and violet-eyed, who would have been about as much in place in managing a farmstead as in presiding over a court of law. But Mrs Dennison decided that she was just the wife for William Henry, and she did all she could to throw them together. In that, however, no effort was needed. William Henry and his cousin seemed to become fast friends at once. On the day following Polly's arrival, he took her out for a long walk in the fields, and when they returned, late for tea, there seemed to be a very excellent understanding between them. After that they were almost inseparable. There was little doing on the farm just then, and there was a capable foreman to see after what was being done, so William Henry, much to his mother's delight, began taking Polly for long drives into the surrounding country. They used to go off early in the morning and return late in the afternoon, each in high spirits. And Mrs Dennison's hopes rose high, and her spirits were as high as theirs. But there were two things Mrs Dennison could not understand. The first was that Miss Durant was as light-hearted as ever, and as arduous in her labours, in spite of the fact that William Henry no longer went walks with her, nor took her to church. The second was that when he and Polly were not driving, they spent a considerable amount of time in the model dairy of an afternoon with Miss Durant, and that unmistakable sounds of great hilarity issued therefrom. But she regarded this with indulgence under the circumstances. When they're together, she said, young folks is inclined to make merry. Of course I must have been mistaken about William Henry being smitten with the dairy maid, considering how he's devoted to his cousin. He was no doubt lonelyish. Young men does get like that though I must say that William Henry never did show himself partial to young ladies. However partial William Henry may or may not have been to young ladies in the past, it was quite certain that he was making up for it at this stage of his existence. The long drives with Polly continued, and Polly came back from each in higher spirits than ever. Mrs Dennison expected every day to hear that her dearest hopes were to be fulfilled. And then came the climax. One evening, following one of the day-long drives, William Henry announced to the family circle that he was going to Clothford next morning and should require breakfast somewhat earlier than usual. By nine o'clock next day he was gone, and Mrs Dennison, not without a smirking satisfaction, noticed that Polly was uneasy and thoughtful and developed a restlessness which got worse and worse. She tried to interest the girl in one way or another, but Polly slipped off to the dairy and spent the entire day, except for mealtimes, with Miss Durant. When evening and high tea came, she could scarcely eat or drink, and her eyes perpetually turned to the grandfather clock. "'If William Henry has missed the 5.30, my dear,' said Miss Dennison, "'he's certain to catch the 6.45. "'He were never one for gallivanting about at Clothford of an evening, "'and, and at that moment, the parlour door opened, and William Henry walked in. "'The girl stood up, and Matthew and his wife, watching keenly, "'saw her turn white to the lips. "'And William Henry saw it too, and he made one stride and caught her by the hands.' "'It's all right, Polly,' he said. "'It's all right. See?' He drew a letter from his pocket, tore the envelope open and handed his cousin the enclosure. She glanced its contents over as if she were dazed, and then, with a wild cry of joy, threw her arms around William Henry and fairly hugged him. And then she threw herself into the nearest chair and began to cry obviously from pure happiness. "'Mercy upon us, William Henry Dennison. What's the meaning of this?' exclaimed William Henry's mother. "'What does it mean?' William Henry picked up the letter. It means this, mother, he said. That's a letter from Uncle John to Polly, giving his full consent to her marriage with a young gentleman who loves her and whom she loves. I've been taking her to meet him for the past month, that's why we went for those long drives, and a real good one he is, and so says Uncle John, now that at last he's met him. <laughs>
You see, Polly told me all about it the first day she was here, and why, of course. With that, William Henry went out of the room in a meaning silence. Of course, said Matthew, of course. If my brother John approves of that young man, it's as good as putting the hallmark on gold or silver. Polly jumped up and kissed him. Then she kissed Mrs. Dennison. But, oh, Polly, Polly, said Mrs. Dennison. I meant you to marry William Henry. But I don't love William Henry in that way, aunt, replied Polly. And besides, William Henry loves... And just then, William Henry made a second dramatic appearance, holding himself very stiffly and straight, and leading in Mr. Rant. Father and mother, he said, this lady's going to be your daughter. So the trouble at Five Oaks Farm came to a good ending, for everybody was satisfied that the best had happened, and therefore was happy.' 